D-Day. Rows of nylon tow ropes were carefully laid out, ready for the takeoff of dozens of twin-toed gliders. Supplies of all kinds were loaded, including bulldozers and equipment for the use of the American engineers in constructing airstrips in the jungle. The pilots and crews gathered to hear final instruction from Colonel Cochran. Now, is there anything anybody doesn't know? If there is, let's get it straight now. Okay, now just before I came over here, I had our final meeting with the British ground troops that you're going to take in there tonight. And I talked to the guy that's got the red flare that you know is going to be shot off if there's too much interference with the first few gliders that land. And he tells me that that flare's in an awful deep pocket and it's going to take somebody an awful lot of finding to get at it. So, if those guys have got that kind of heart and they've got that kind of guts, it's up to us to get them in there so they can do their job and get them in right. Now tonight, your whole reason for being, your whole existence is going to be jammed up into a couple minutes and it's just going to balance it there and it's going to take your character to bring it through. Now nothing you've ever done before in your life means a thing. Tonight you're going to find out you've got a soul. Good luck. The transport stood ready for takeoff. Gliders were lined up. Suddenly there appeared in the sky above a plane returning from a last minute reconnaissance flight. Something was wrong. Photos revealed that the main field was hopelessly obstructed. Tree trunks and logs had been strewn over it so the glider landings on this field were impossible. The troops waited for Cochrane and Wingate to make a decision. It wasn't long in coming. Within 15 minutes, they were climbing into the gliders. An alternative strip known as Broadway was now to be the main airbase. At dusk, the first planes took off, each transport towing twin gliders. Within them, men sat silently, grimly, waiting for what lay ahead. When the sun rose over Broadway, it revealed a field littered with wounded gliders. There were wounded men, too, and some beyond wounds. The first glider had bumped to a halt on a field rutted by buffalo bogs and elephant footprints and strewn with large teakwood logs hidden from the eyes of reconnaissance cameras by the tall grass. A second glider came in, then a third. They followed one another so fast that it was impossible to clear the field of obstructions and the wrecked gliders. The wounded were tended on the field. Patrols fanned out through the jungle to give protection to the small band of engineers and wounded. They buried their dead in the Burmese jungle. Their Burmese padre read the last rites. And his words mingled with the sound of bulldozers and tractors leveling the field for the arrival that night of the first flight of transports carrying the remainder of the airborne troops. By that afternoon, the engineers had completed their work. Broadway was open for business. That night and for six successive nights, RAF and American pilots of the Troop Carrier Command, led by Brigadier General William D. Old, flew back and forth between Lalligat and the jungle strip of Broadway, which became a base from which patrols of Chindits fanned out in all directions. With the arrival of RAF Spitfires and American P-51s on Broadway, air protection was made available to cover operations. But the enemy struck back. Eight days after our troops had landed, Broadway was attacked by Zeros in a series of raids. American and British planes landed and took off within close range of the Japs. The enemy succeeded in capturing the far end of the field, but were held there by Allied ground and air fighters, their wings armed with bazookas. silenced, and its troops forced back into the jungle. 
General Wingate had paid one of his many visits to Broadway about this time. On his return flight to his base, his plane crashed in the jungle in Assam. Broadway, an airfield carved out of the jungle, stood as a fit memorial to General Charles Ord Wingate. Early in March, the Japs made an attempt to regain the initiative. They moved three divisions to the Chindwin River, crossed it, and struck at Imphal in India in a powerful pincher movement aimed at cutting the Bengal Assam Railway, carrying supplies to the Allied troops in northern Burma. Headlines all over the world blazed the news that Jap armies were on Indian soil, that India had been invaded. The announcements, as usual, were premature. But the Allied situation, nevertheless, was extremely grave. Reinforcements were desperately needed. Once again, transports of the American Troop Carrier Command were called in. An entire Arakan division with mules and supplies were carried 230 miles by air from one fighting front to another. By the beginning of April, one Japanese force was eight miles from Imphal, while another had advanced on Kohima. They cut the roads surrounding Kohima, including the Manipur Road, the 14th Army's main supply line. At Kohima, a small hill station, a garrison of British and Indian infantry dug in and held on to a hill position overlooking the town. Serving ammunition, the garrison held on. Daily transports brought over ammunition, food, water, and vital medical necessities. The hill soon became known to the troops as Parachute Hill. For 13 days, the garrison held out against a force three times its strength. 